you to Java. And so that was kind of a jump, but we, we figured it out. All right, in a bit. Okay, let's get started. All right, so welcome to our second automation workshop. Um, yeah, so today um, we're kind of doing a, we're continuing the part one. So we're gonna do a little brief about us. We have some new presenters today. We're gonna go over some FRC specific resources, some electrical basics, um, and a little like program walkthrough. And then at the end, we'll have a Q and A and a post survey. So yeah. So that is again, I think all of you joined last time. My name is Lena, I'm in 11th grade and I'm the automation director. Hi everyone, I'm Troy. I am going into 11th grade and I am the automation manager. I'm Trey, and I'm also in 11th grade, and also an automation manager. Yeah, and, and just to like go over again, so the automation director is kind of like over, like head of the sub team, and then the managers are also helping head that sub team, and they um, they will get like a more specific roles in the build season. Somebody might be a manager of like autonomous, or somebody might be a manager of like a certain part of the robot, but we haven't decided those yet. So yeah, they're just team leaders. Um, so just again, like a brief overview, what is automation? We're working with the robots control system and any additional like software that goes along with it. We're also, um, this year especially, we've kind of like changed the organization of our team. We're gonna be a lot more involved in electrical and we thought it would be good to present that because it's a useful skill to know, especially as like as a programmer because you have to understand how the control um, the control scheme works um, when you're programming. So we're just going to go ahead and get started with that. All right. So basically, when you're coding for FRC on automation, you always want to have um, a source of knowledge that you can draw from, so that it makes it easier on the load for yourself. So you don't have to like, you know. Uh, learn everything for yourself. There are plenty of resources out there that can help you with finding issues that you don't know a solution to or finding new solutions to a problem you've already encountered before. And um, you can go ahead and move on, please. So basically, there are a few main ones, and one of those is WPI Library. It's free and it's based entirely online, so you don't have to download anything. There are plenty of links that you can click on for um, mul many different aspects of automation and electrical systems. So you can click on those and it'll take you step by step through each uh, process for coding and connecting those um, components with each other. And then basically when you're starting something completely scratch, you want to go to WPI to get that base, those that base information. And their website w is linked in this slide that we'll be sending to you all afterwards. And then Chief Delphi is another um, resource that is more like a forum that everyone can discuss in comments about um, issues that you may be having or code that you have to start writing for components on the robot. And it's a really great way to learn from other people who have more experience or to get really uh, interesting solutions to problems you not, might not have thought of before. And um, it's a great way of also finding resources from other teams that you can hold, not really accountable, but you can keep in contact with these people to have sort of like these supply chains of experienced coders, you know? And then remember, there's nothing wrong with Googling. You can always Google something if you can't find it on WPI, Chief Delphi, or anything else you may have seen before. No shame in it. And uh, their website is also going to be linked in these slides. And um, you can ask it anything. It may take you a little while to find the solution, but you'll get it eventually. And then we, our team has an automation resources doc. And that's basically just a hub of all the information you'll need on our automation team. We've made our own copy 
to share with y'all so you can add to it or change it according to your team's needs or your own personal needs. And it's a great way to make sure that you have one spot that everyone can go to on your team that um, just ensures that you have plenty of answers and plenty of questions that you can ask for uh, automation purposes on your team. And then now, because of how involved we're going to be with electrical, you gotta know the basics of everything. And it's not super hard, but there are plenty of things that definitely mesh with each other in multiple ways. But we're gonna start out. So you're going to have a battery on your robot. Usually use a motorcycle battery because FRC robots are pretty power hungry. So, um, I mean, you kind of need that. And then the first thing connected to the battery is going to be the circuit breaker. Act as sort of a last resort where if you need to shut off the robot, you can just hit that button and power will be completely cut. And then you have the RoboRio, which is the brain of the robot. It takes all the data from the code and the computer that it's connected to and deals that out to all the components along the robot. And the way we get the code to the RoboRio is the radio. So basically the radio acts as the wireless connection from the computer to the Rio that you can use to deploy code or get data from the Robo Rio. So both ways it works. You can also use a wired connection, but we mostly use the radio. And then your motor controllers, you're gonna have plenty of different types of motor controllers depending on what type of motor you use. So these receive power from power distribution panel, an info from the control area network and the pulse with modulation wires that will allow the motors to be controlled very effectively by the code from the Rover Rio. And as you can see, there are five pretty main types of motor controllers, but there you have them on the screen right there. And then the power distribution panel does exactly what its name says it does. It takes power from the battery and distributes it to all the other components so that you don't have to run a bunch of wires from the battery itself. It's a good hub and uh, allows for wiring of different voltages and different resistances. And then the VRM, the voltage regulator module, provides a bit more regulated power to certain electrical components like the radio or the cameras that don't need the full power coming directly from the battery and PDP. It's a bit smaller. And then the PCM, which stands for the pneumatics control model, uh, monitors and controls all the solenoids and compressors on the robot. So for example, if you have a component on your robot like a claw or an arm that is controlled by pneumatics, this will be controlling the pressure that goes on each side of the relay and will control when these sites get pressure, which will in turn control that component. And then the CAN bus, the controller area network bus, is a chain of little yellow and green wires that connect to the RoboRio and convey various information to all components, well, not all components, but components across the entirety of the robot, like PDP, PCM, and some motor controllers. So this takes that data and sends it to those from the code in the RoboRio. And then another way of communication using wires that is separate from the CAN bus is the PWM or pulse width modulation. And these basically will take information from the Rio and mostly be connected to components like motor controllers. And this is sort of the layout of all the electrical components that you're going to see. So you see the Rio, which is connected to the radio and the VRM, and 
the PDP and everything from the battery and the uh, circuit breaker and then various motor controllers next to the PDP, both sides, and then the pneumatics on the bottom with the compressor, the pressure switch, and the PCM. And all of this is going to be connected together sort of like that. And then for starting out, we've put a link into the slides with the library from WPI on how to start wiring an FRC robot. You're still muted, Lena. All right, sorry about that. <laughs> um, thank you, Troy. Um, if you have any, any questions about electrical, you can ask them now or you can ask them later. Um, that was a very great um, like overview of all the electrical components. So thank you, Troy. Thank you. Um, so now we're kind of gonna change things up a little bit. We're gonna do a little like programming walkthrough. And this is kind of gonna go over like the basic steps when you're making, um, you're writing your robot program in Java and in VS Code. And so um, we kind of have this set up so that um, we're playing a video as we're like explaining things. So if a video isn't clear, please just let me know I'll, and I'll try to fix that. But all right, let's get started. So the first thing, creating a robot program, this is pretty basic. There is a link over here um, with like the steps. I th it's a WPI link. They're, they're an amazing source. Um, and I, I just kind of put a put a little bubble around this um, this command because this is really useful. You're going to end up using a lot like control shift P um, pretty much every single time you're using a command in VS Code. So that's just like a good thing to note. So let's get started. So can everybody see the video? It's just good. Yeah. All right. I'm going to take your silence as a yes. <laughs> okay. So here, the first thing you're going to do is you're just going to hit control shift P. It's going to open up that terminal there you saw, and you can type it in. You can say like, um, create robot project. That's all you have to type in and it'll bring you to this like type window. And you're just going to like select a project type. So we're going to select a template. We're going to use Java. And then if you see here, there's a lot of different types. Um, WPI and our team, we recommend using the command robot. It's, uh, it's just, it's a very nice like layout. It's really easy, it's, it's well organized. And there's a lot, a lot of documentation on that template. There are different templates um, as you can see here. Um, this old command robot too, uh, it was, it was used, um, I think, pre-2020. So um, they also have that available. But yeah, this command robot, this command style robot is gonna be the like go-to. Um, then you select your project folder. For some reason, it, this wasn't recording the file explorer, but I just put it on the desktop. Um, then you project name, pretty basic. We just called this workshop two example. And then you type in your team number. I accidentally typed it into the wrong <laughs> field. And then um, you're just going to generate your project. And this, this window is going to pop up. It's just going to have like a little welcome WPI help. You don't really need that. You can just like exit all out, you know. Um, but the folder you're going to be the most worried about is this source folder right here. Um, the other stuff you don't really have to worry about. You, you don't touch that. Um, I don't even think it, let, it lets you edit that stuff. But um, yeah, so you just kind of hit source, Java, don't worry about the deploy folder. And there you see command substance, subsystems, constants, main, robot, robot container. Those are gonna be your main, your main classes that we talked about. Um, these commands and subsystems are folders, so they'll contain more classes in them. Um, but these you're just gonna have to, um, this is where you're gonna be writing all your code in here. You don't have to worry about all this other stuff. Um, so yeah, and like you can just test it out. I opened up the robot class and it kind of already has this stuff written for you in there and yeah. So the next step 
um, before we get too involved in the robot program, I just wanted to talk very briefly about third party libraries. So there's this whole process that we kind of glossed over. You can go to WPI and they'll walk you through the whole like setup process process. Um, there's like certain software stuff you have to download. You have to download VS Code, obviously, and like the FRC WPI like extensions and libraries and stuff. But there's other companies that sell products that FRC goes to. So, um, for example, um, there's CTRE Electronics, Rev Robotics, Quai Labs. They all sell like little parts that you can buy for your robot. But the code that you need also needs to be installed separately to like work with those components. And so you want to make sure that you always have all of your third party libraries imported. So these are just kind of common ones that our team uses. You might have other ones. Um, WPI has a whole page on like different third party libraries. And so I'm just going to give you a brief example of how to import those libraries and how um, you use them in your code. So um, I, I'm going to give a little disclaimer to um, for some reason, my screen recorder wasn't letting me switch tabs. That's why there's three different videos. So I had to record each tab separately. So I'm going to show you right now how to download the Spark Max Rev Robotics. That's a type, a Spark Max is a type of motor controller. Troy talked about those a little earlier. They're just like these little electrical components that basically interpret information you send to it and make the motor do stuff, hence the name motor controller. So you just look up. Spark Max, Software Resources, that's all I went to. And this Rev Robotics is very organized. There's two things we're going to be looking at, the Spark Max client application and the Java API. So the Spark Max client application, um, a lot of third party libraries have this, especially for motor controllers. That is basically going to allow you to, you can plug in the motor controller directly to your computer and adjust it there. But I'm going to go into that a little further. You just click on that. You hit this big download button, super, super straightforward, you know. And then the Java API. So what the Java API is, is it's basically the library for all of the code specific to Spark Max, right? So there's two different ways you can do it. There's an online installation and an offline installation. Either one works. Um, online installation is just a lot easier because you don't have to do this whole download stuff. So I'm going to show the online installation. Offline isn't that different. You just hit download and run, run it basically. But you're going to copy this, um, this link here, right? And we're going to save that to the clipboard and then we're going to use it in VS Code. Oops. Okay, let's go to this next video. So now that you're in VS Code, you hit um, Control Shift P again, and you're going to type in this command manage vendor libraries. Um, like I said, managing third party libraries. So it's going to give you a bunch of different options manage current libraries, check for updates, install new libraries. So remember, there's an offline and an online version. So you want to click that online button right because that's the one we installed and then it's just going to say enter the vendor url and so you just paste that in there and then enter and then it's in there now obviously i'm getting this message down here that says library is already installed we already have that on here we've already done this process but for you it should give a little message saying like library is installed now and you should be good so yeah and now what that will do, it, was, it will import basically that code from that library into your project. So you can like call on um, like that Spark Max specific stuff. Let me just move this window over here. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is the client application. Um, as you can see, it has a lot of stuff. There's like basic. You can change the ID of your motor controller. You can um, change the type of sensor or 
um, change the type of motor. There's brushless and brushed for sparks. Encoder counts, like all this stuff. There's limit switches. You can set a ton of stuff in here. It's super useful. Um, you can even do all this advanced stuff. There's just a ton of different options. If you go to network, you can actually um, see the scan bus here. That's actually referring to the CAN bus. Um, Spark Max is connected over the CAN bus. So you can actually load all of the firmware onto all of them at the same time if they're all connected to the CAN properly. So that's like incredibly useful. Um, and yeah, so you, you always wanna make sure that like your firmware is updated. So this console at the bottom will let you know like what the latest firmware is. Obviously, I don't have these at my house, so I can't really show how you connect them. You just plug a little USB in and it should show up at the top here. But um, yeah, that's that's basically it. There's um, a client application for the Phoenix stuff. That's just like a useful thing. It's a useful tool. And then I put a link down here for more information on that. Okay, so this is gonna be like the long section, but before we move on to that, does anybody have any questions? Okay, everything is clear. I know I went by that a little fast. Okay. And just to so, let everyone know real quick, mm -hmm. I will be monitoring the chat the entire time. So if you have any questions, you can put them in there and I can either relay them to Lena if I can't answer them or I can answer them in chat. Yeah, thank you, Troy. Um, okay, so this is going to be actually going through how to write your program, right? So this is a 20 minute long process. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So you're going to, I left off where you open up to your robot program, right? And we're going to go through all these. Um, first thing you need to do is this template, it gives you a ton of example stuff. You just want to go in and delete that. It's going to give you a ton of errors, but it's really easy to fix that. Just delete all the stuff you don't need. Um, that's going to be under subsystems, commands, all that example stuff you can get rid of. And then if you see here, like this example command, example subsystem, you can just get rid of that. There's stuff down here. You can also just get rid of that. I mean, it's, it's useful. Like if you're just starting, um, you can use that as like reference. Down here, it's also causing an error because it's calling on M auto command, which I just deleted. So for now, I'm just gonna have that return nothing and I'm gonna put in null. So it's just not doing anything. And that'll get rid of the error. And we're gonna put something in that a little later, right? Um, so yeah, that's, that's we're gonna replace something later. But for now, let's just go, let's just get started. Okay, so I think the first class that you should start with is constants. Constants, its name is just a place where you put all of your stuff you don't want to change. It's just like a good, it's just a good spot to make sure that um, anything you want to keep constant, no matter what, you can just put it there. And so we're going to start by making some variables for our motor controllers, right? So Troy explained what motor controllers are. They're basically, um, like I said, these little electrical things that control the motors, but you need to give them an ID number. And if you remember from the client application, that was one of the options, right? And by default, they're all, they're all defined as zero, okay? But if you have multiple motor controllers, say you have four different motors, you're going to need four different multiple co motor controllers. You're going to need four different ID numbers. You can assign them yourselves. I recommend zero through three. It's always good to start at zero. And we don't want those to change, right? We don't want the motor controller IDs to get mixed up. We want always a certain motor controller to have the same ID. So we're going to make that those ID numbers an integer constant. Um, these are just describers. Um, final means it's not going to be changing. Static is just a way to reference it, and public means it can be accessible from everywhere. So as you can see, I'm making an integer. Its name is FL. I'm just saying front left motor controller, and its ID number is zero. 
So I'm just going to assume for this that we have four motor controllers and there's going to be a front left, a back left, a front right, and a back right. And right now, as you can see, I'm going to assign them different values. And so yeah, that, that's all you're doing here with the constants and stuff. You're just putting in everything. And notice how I put it in all caps, right? Because um, it's a constant. That's just like a convention. You don't have to do it that way, but it's good to do it. And as you can see, I named something wrong, so it's giving me an error. So yeah, see, no errors. It's good that when you're finished with a class to save it after you're done, um, just hit Control S, that'll save it. And yeah, so we're gonna move on to making a subsystem next for our motor controllers. So that you just hit that thing at the bottom, new class command. You don't wanna hit old subsystem. You wanna type in subsystem new. Yes, that's the right one because you do not wanna get that mixed up. So I'm just gonna call it drive base. This is basically gonna control the chassis, right? So the wheels, what direction it can go in. So this is what a subsystem looks like, right? So I'm gonna give a brief explanation of what is a subsystem. So a subsystem is where you define all of the um, properties of a certain part of your robot. So you're going this is a drive base subsystem. This is defining the certain properties of my drive base. So I'm gonna say, how many motors are there? Oh, do we have stuff in the chat? Oh, okay. To clarify, do you give all motor controllers IDs or only those that use CAN? Yeah, I, I think all, all of them use IDs. Um, we mostly use CAN motor controllers, so that's what I'm most familiar with. Like Spark Max, the Phoenix ones, the CTRE, those are all like, can be controlled over. Um, well, actually, actually, when it's connected over like PWM, there's ports on the Robo Rio. And so I think it'll be, um, it'll take in, it'll ask you instead of an ID number, it'll ask you what port it's connected to. Does that answer your question? Just as a clarification. Okay, cool. That makes sense to everybody. Yeah. So I'm showing I'm showing how to do it with a can because that's kind of like I guess more common. I mean not more common, but like generally the motor controllers that use can are just nicer. Um, but yes, that, that was a good question. So anyway, a drive base. A drive base, like I said, it defines a certain properties of a subsystem. You might have uh, an arm subsystem that defines the motor controllers for that. You might have a climber subsystem that controls that, right? Now the difference between a subsystem and a command, which you will later see, is that a command will be like drive forward. So, oh, more chat stuff. Oh, okay. So a subsystem, there's drive base, whereas a command would be drive forward. So the command is gonna use the drive base subsystem. So you're gonna say, okay, yeah, take this drive base, but do stuff with it. So that's the difference between a command and a subsystem. So right now we're gonna make that subsystem. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna have to make your your motor controller objects. Now, I'm just kind of making a comment here. This is a constructor. We talked about it last time. Um, obviously, it's empty right now. For a sub, like for this type of drive base, you don't really need anything in here. Um, but I just wanted to point that out. Like, see how it it's kind of formatted as a method. It has the same name as the class. So yeah, I just wanted to point that out. But we're going to make motor controller objects right here right so remember how an object is an instance of a class and so that means that we need a can spark max class right we need because that's the type of motor controller we're using right 
that's what the third party libraries are for. They already have a class written for this with all of the info. You're importing that so you can borrow that class and make your motor controller objects from that, right? So here, when you create an object for CanSpark Max, it's calling for two inputs, the device ID and the type of motor controller. Now, other motor controllers call for different things. Like I said, um, the PWM motor controllers are gonna call for like a channel. Um, uh, CTR might just need the ID, it doesn't need necessarily the type. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna type in our constants class, right? And get front left, right? So that's always gonna be saying the same, right? So what we're doing there is we're calling on the class constants that we made and we're saying dot get the value for front left. And remember we made that zero, right? And as you can see at the top, it automatically did this for us. It imported constants. So it does, it, VS Code's really nice. It'll do that for you automatically. It's best practice, like if you have an error under something like this, if you hover over it, a little light bulb should appear. If you have like a problem, see that there. And if you hit that light bulb, it sometimes will say, you need to import this. So as you can see, I needed to import the class motor type and it imported right here automatically for me. And I'm gonna, it's a brushless motor instead of a brushed motor. Um, I should know the difference between them. I don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's mech, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, all I know is we're using brushless motors and then you finish it off with a semicolon and we're going to make three more of those because we have four different motors, right? And I'm just highlighting these imports again. It just, see, it got it from the URL that I got and it got those classes, right? So, yep. And so I'm just making a couple more of those, naming them, um, their appropriate names. And then we're going to also change this constant section here because we want it to match the input. And yeah, so I'm just going to let the video play out for a little bit. And yeah, so it's just really that easy. Um, it's really like not that bad. Okay, so the next section. This is going to be grouping motor controllers. So this will, you'll kind of understand this in a little bit, but it's good. You can group them like left and right. Um, and to do that, you can use a speed controller group. And that, like I said, again, is another class that, if you see here, it's a WPI first import. And that you don't have to download separately because it downloads when you get VS Code and all that stuff with you. So it's pretty nice. WPI is amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I, it imported that. I'm going to call this left motors. And then it's just going to ask me to import the two left motor controllers. So I'm going to put front left motor and back left motor. And so now all of those um, motor controllers are basically going to do the same thing. So if I give a command to left motors, the front left and back left motor will execute the same task. And that's just a good way to make sure that like, you're not telling two motors that are going supposed to be going the same direction, like conflicting commands, because that could damage your chassis. And we don't really want that. So yeah, so I made one for left and right. Now, this final thing is kind of, um, it's called differential drive. So differential drive, it basically gives you, it's, it's a class that gives you access to different control types for your robot. So as you can imagine, there's different ways you can program your joysticks to control a robot. Um, and there's different ways you can control your robot. So I'm making a differential drive object so I can have access to those different control types. So this is going to ask for two inputs, the left and right. So we're just going to put in left motors and right motors and see now it's all grouped together. And yeah, so when we call on this later, which I will show you, 
And this was the thing I was saying about importing it. I clicked that little light bulb and import, and now it's going to import it from WPI. There we go. So yeah, um, the differential drive, there's arcade drive, tank drive. You've probably heard of stuff like swerve drive. I, I don't think that's actually differential drive. But anyway, it just gives you access to different types of ways to control your robot and makes it like a lot easier that way. So you don't have to code it all yourself. Okay, so now we're going to go to robot container and okay, let's explain like what robot container actually is. It's kind of basically where all of your code is. It's like all of your, the bulk of your code should end up. Um, like it, it's a robot container. It's containing basically like all the stuff that's making your code actually do things because like obviously right now we have a drive base but it can't do anything yet so in robot container we're going to make all of the xbox like all the controllers buttons all that stuff and we're going to bind those controls to the subsystem or command so the first thing you need to do is make an object of your drive base right so you need to say I have a drive base it exists right so you're instantiating an instance of a drive base class right so I made this class right it's drive base it's right over here too I'm just gonna call it M drive base new drive base and if you remember there was nothing in that constructor so we don't need to put any of these inputs in parentheses so all we're saying here is we're bringing this drive base into existence. And you saw again, I had to import it and there it comes up right there above in the imports. Okay, so now we're gonna start to make all of the controllers and the joysticks. And so you see here, I'm like writing all these comments so people know like what is happening here. Um, there's already a lot of comments written for you. You can delete those or you can keep them. I'm just keeping them for time's sake. But okay. Again, as you see, I am calling on a class that is already written for me, uh, made by WPI, and I'm just going to call it Drive Joy, right? Now, if you see there, Xbox controller, it has in parentheses int port. That means it needs an integer that calls its port number, right? So Xbox controllers, that's what we use, are plugged into a USB port. So those USB ports are either 0, 1, 2, 3, depending on how many you have. So I'm going to go to constants, and I'm going to make um, a port number that is either 0 or 1. As you can see here also, I'm making two different joysticks, um, or two different Xbox controller we used to we have one for the driver and one for the operator so that's why it's op joy drive joy just to clarify and then I'm going to go to constants make another one of these ID numbers but instead for the joysticks and yeah so I'm just going to do like the make the describers make it final so it's not changing integer drive joy and it's going to be zero and this is going to be important later, the port number you give it, because you'll be actually be able to see the port your controller is plugged into on your driver station. We're going to go over the driver station in a bit, but this is actually going to be important when you're setting up to drive your robot. Okay, so this process that I did um, next isn't, isn't mandatory but it is good because the xbox controller class that they give you doesn't do all this stuff for you i'm gonna adjust the joystick outputs by giving them dead zones and what dead zone means is say i have my controller right if i hit the joystick just slightly forward the robot may just go shooting forward right and we don't want that so we're we want to give it a little um a little dead zone. Basically, it's going to say, don't move unless you go past this point, right? So that's all we're doing. So I'm making a method here. 
and I'm gonna say like get drive joy I think I fixed that later I know it's an F kind of annoying <laughs> but um so yeah and so here as you can see remember we went over methods there's going to be the public it's returning a double so a decimal this is the name of the method and you need to put in the axis of the joystick right so on an xbox controller right there's technically four axes there's left like because you know there's like two little joystick parts right so there's going to be an x for the right a y for the right a y for the left and an x, an x for the left so i'm just making it easier i'm just making one and you just have to put in the axis so i'm going to add another constant with all the axes um and yeah this is the dead zone I'm making right here. So that's zero. I think I changed it to two. Yeah, okay, it's two. So then I'm just gonna skip through this a little bit. Okay. Okay, so let's pause to see what this is doing for a second. So it's taking in the axis, right? So I'll call this method later and I'll input an axis, axis, whether it be zero, one, whatever. It's gonna take the raw value. So raw value equals drive joy. So it's calling the drives, the drop, like the controller that is plugged into the drive joy port, which is zero. So it's taking the controller that's plugged into port zero and it's getting the raw axis value from whatever input we tell it. So if this is axis zero, then it's going to get the, the reading from axis zero of the controller that's plugged into port zero, right? Then it's going to do a little bit of logic and we're going to return this, um, this double, right? So basically this is something called a ternary operator. It's basically an if statement and you can kind of read it like this. If the absolute value of raw is less than the dead zone, so 0 0.2. So if the absolute value of the reading on the joystick is less than the dead zone, return zero. So that's just saying don't move the robot, right? If it's greater than zero, I mean, if it's greater than the dead zone, return raw. So return the value it's reading. And that will basically just prevent it from moving if you barely hit the joystick, just creating a little cushion for the driver, basically. And so we're gonna do um, the same type thing for the opjoy. It's pretty simple. All you have to do is change opjoy. You also have to change this to opjoy. Yeah, it does the same thing basically. Um, yeah, pretty basic. It's just simple, simple logic. Um, if you have any questions, oh wait, there's 11 questions, or I mean, there's 11 things in the chat. Okay, let me just read these. What is driver op? Okay, two different people. Okay, driving. Blah, 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 blah. How do you make the computer keyboard command for the robots use its? Okay, wait. Okay, how do you make the computer? The robot's cockpit that shows the velocity, the amount of charge left, and how do you create keyboard commands for the robot to use its tool? Oh, okay. So basically, um, you, okay. So for that question, you're we always use like controllers that you plug into the robot to like control the robot. So that's the commands I'm creating right now to like make the robot lift up a water bottle, for example. For computer, like showing like velocity, that type of stuff, like printing stuff to the screen, you can do that. We'll show you that in a little bit. And I think, I assume by the amount of charge left, you mean the battery charge. That will also be all displayed on the driver station. Um, Trey's gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, so I'm just gonna finish up this section and we will get back to that. Um, yes. Okay. 
Um, okay, I'm just going to fast forward a little bit through this because we're running. We're too, well, we've been on this for a while. Now, for this, I just kind of wanted to demonstrate that there's other things you can do to adjust um, the drive the drive stuff. Um, here, I'm just making all the axes, basically, so you can call them, blah, blah, blah. We're just going to skip this. It's not as important. Um, and remember, I said that the joysticks have different axes. Those are all defined also in a library. You can just Google, like, what are the axes defined as on an Xbox controller. So X left is 0, Y left is 1, and then, you know, I think this is four and five for the axes, but you can just Google that. Um, okay, I'm just gonna show some logic here. Um, okay, see this, I made this here because a lot of times you also, when you're controlling the robot, you have problems um, with how fast it goes. So if you, um, sometimes you want to scale the output of the joystick meaning that say you have like okay imagine the joystick is on a coordinate plane right so you have um positive is above negative is below the x-axis you know so when you're going forward right like in a linear way it's going to just increase the velocity and so sometimes you want to adjust that so that the output it speeds up slower so that it's not so fast when you're like speeding up um, when you're using the controller so what we did here is we just did something similar we use a ternary operator and this is a ternary operator within a ternary operator <laughs> so we're just saying if the absolute value of the raw is less than dead zone then I make it zero if it's if it's not less than the dead zone, check this next statement. So if the raw is greater than zero, meaning if it's positive, then do the stuff to scale it, right? So we're just scaling it there. And then if it's, if it's less than zero, meaning it's negative, scale it the same way, but make sure it's returning a negative. Because otherwise it'll always be going forward, even if you're going backwards. So that's just like another example of logic and using operators and like mathematical stuff. I just want to show that because we talked about it last time. Um, I hope that makes sense for everybody. And we're almost done with this section. So this part is really easy. So what I did is I create a method to call teleop, right? So this, all my code inside of this teleop method will be dedicated to the teleop section. So I'm going to call on drive base, right? And remember, we made that up here. That's the drive base object. I'm calling on this class here. Then I'm going to call on M drive, which is the differential drive. And remember, I said that gives you access to different types of ways to control your drive, right? So if I hit M drive, then I'm going to say dot and it, add, it gives you all these different options. So there's curvature drive, arcade drive. I think there's also tank drive, but we're going to select arcade drive because that's pretty simple. And arcade drive, see, it needs speed, which is basically forward or backward motion and rotation. So left and right. So for me, the obvious ones for that is going to be, okay, this is the driver who's going to be controlling this. So we're going to call and get drive joy. And then we're gonna put constants dot y left. And I skipped over this a little bit, but basically y left in constants is one. So that's saying get the axis that is titled one, which is equivalent to the, the y left axes on the controller, right? that is going to control my forward and backward motion. So it's basically like saying, if I go forward with my left hand on the controller, the robot's gonna go forward too. Now, with the get drive joy XR, that's gonna control rotation, right? And see, I made a specific class for that to scale that, right? So I don't need to input this. 
I could input it, but it wouldn't have all this extra stuff. But as you can see, I'm inputting two different methods that return doubles so that it moves our cage drive. So now I'm actually doing stuff with the robot. If I move my joysticks around, it will actually do stuff. So, yep, the last and the final step to this teleop driving process is you need to go to robot. So we're going to go to robots. Yes. Okay. <laughs> robot you don't want to change that much in it. It basically just divides up your code into different parts of the match, right? So when your robot is in init, that's here, initialize robot. See this? This is saying that robot container exists. It's instantiating this robot container. So when the robot initializes, it's going to say everything inside of robot container exists and you can control it. And so yeah, basically that's that's all it's doing. And so we're going to go down to the teleop section. Um, as you can see, there's also an autonomous section, which I'm going to show how to do commands in a sec a bit. But here I'm going to teleop periodic. And I'm just going to call on M robot container. Like because it was already instantiated and I'm going to say dot teleop. Right? So that was the method we made in robot container. Right? That will call all of our teleop code, basically. And yeah, so that's that's basically all you have to do. You just go through constants, make a subsystem, go back to robot container, and then call it all into robot. So yeah, that's that's how you do teleop stuff. Are there any questions? Um, nothing in the chat. Alrighty. So I'm going to move on to um, autonomous. And this one's a lot shorter. Um, this is really not that bad. Okay. So we're going to make a little command now. And I'm just going to take the same code I did. And we're going to go to commands. And just give me a sec. Okay. Commands, create a new class command at the bottom. You're going to hit type in command new, not command old, command new. And I'm going to name it drive forward. And so that's what we're going to make our, our robot do when this command is run. So once again, this is a constructor, drive forward. It's named the same as a class. And this time we're actually going to, we're going to make, give the constructor some stuff. So as you can see, this also has some other stuff. So here we're going to give the drive forward some speed. So we're going to say, OK, we want, we want this class to input, to take in a speed when it runs its commands, right? Because we might want it to drive forward at different speeds. And this is a good way to like reuse this. If you just designate a speed for it to drive forward at, you won't be able to change it. But this way, if you want to call this command multiple times throughout your, your code, you can just input a speed and it'll change whatever you want, right? So here you have some commands, I mean methods, and these are all in it, like created for you. Initialize is when it's scheduled. Um, execute is what we're going to be paying attention to right now, right? So this is where you write what you want the robot to do. So I'm calling on robots, right? So robot is this class here, the one with all of the schedule, like all the different methods, dividing it up in, by um, the section of the match. I'm calling a robot, and I'm calling on M robot container, which was instantiated inside of robot, right? Then inside of robot container, there's drive base, right? And then inside of drive base, there's M drive. <laughs> I know this is kind of like complicated, but you just need to make sure you're calling the right parts. And then we're going to make a new arcade drive, right? And here we're going to put in speed. So that's the speed we get in the in constructor. And we're going to put in zero because we don't want it to rotate. We just want it to drive forward a certain speed, right? And I just need to import robot. 
I'm going to change a few like um, accessibility things. Um, I think we can just skip that. I think I just ran into like a little problem here. It was just an easy fix. Um, I think all you had to do was put um, static in front of robot. Yeah, I think I had to make that public and make it static. Okay, but anyway, let me just skip through this. Yeah, that's what it was. Okay. And in drive forward, see, there's no error anymore. I just added public static in front of that. Oh, wait, what was it? Oh, I didn't save it. That's why. See, okay, when it has a circle thing, that means it's not saved. And when oftentimes you'll have errors and you don't know why you have errors and it's just because you didn't save something and see, now it's fixed. That's all I did. I saved it. Okay. So now this is going to drive forward when it's executed. Now, right now, it doesn't really have anything to stop it. So we're going to make a little sensor, which is going to be a digital input. And once again, this is already made in WPI. We're just going to call that in. And our digital input is going to be a limit switch. Now, I don't know if you guys are familiar with a limit switch, but it's like this little clicky thing. And if you hit the button, it's either closed or open, right? It's digital. It's either zero, one. True, false. Kind of like a Boolean, right? So you make your digital input stuff and you're gonna, it's gonna ask you what is it plugged into. And so I just make a little constant thing saying it's gonna be plugged into this. Once again, I make a part um, in constants. We can just kind of skip over that again. There's really no need. I think you guys get how to make a variable. Just call it lim. Okay. And I import constants, right? So now this limit switch object is in existence and I forgot to save again. See, there's a circle there. Okay. Come on. Okay. All right. So now there's this, this, this method at the end and it says returns true when the command should end. So we want it to stop driving forward when this limit switch is pressed. So imagine you have your robot and your limit switch is on the outside and you want it to stop when it hits a wall. So basically when the limit switch is closed, right? I don't think anybody would actually ever do that, but I mean, technically you could do it that way. Um, this is just an example of how you can implement sensors into like autonomous. And it's a very simple sensor, but we're gonna have it do a little bit of logic and test um, and make it stop, right? So let's, okay, the reason I put, so limit switch dot get, what it's doing is it's re either returning true or false, right? Open or closed. So it returns true if the limit switch is open, right? We want this to return true when the limit switch is closed, right? Because when the limit switch is pressed, then we want it to stop running, right? That's why I added the little like exclamation point there because that means not. So if the limit switch dot get is not true, right? You see what I'm saying here? So it's gonna return the opposite so it does what we want it to do. And so, yeah, that's basically gonna be it for that. Um, does that make sense? Like that logic, everything? Yes. Okay. So we're going to move on. I'm going to skip. I was just writing a comment and making it look nice because <laughs> I thought I'd, I didn't know I would be able to pause it. Um, okay. Here we go. So now you remember at the beginning, I was like, yeah, we're just going to make this null. But this is get autonomous command. So we're going to make this drive forward limit switch thing our autonomous, right? So all you have to do is you have to instantiate your new command. So you just type in new drive forward. And then you just got to import that. And then we're good. And remember I said it needs input speed. So I just said it's going to go at a quarter speed, right? Of it. So yeah. And you just hit that, import it, and then you're good. And I'm going to go over like the um, 
the logic. See, this is already made for you. Um, I'm going to show you in robot. Okay. And then this will be pretty much it. So in robot, you're going to scroll down and you're going to, let's look here. So in autonomous init, it's calling m autonomous command, right? And we're saying that's m robot container dot get autonomous command. And that was the method that we were writing in just a second ago, right? So it's going to say if this command is not null, so if it has something in it, schedule that command. So get that command ready to run. And this is good because it takes time for your autonomous to kind of go through its whole process. So that's why we're doing this in autonomous init and not autonomous periodic, right? So it's scheduling this command and it's gonna run during autonomous periodic, right? Well, actually it's just gonna run throughout the, all, the autonomous section. And that's, that's the method I'm calling on in robot container, right? And so then if you scroll down a little bit, um, here in teleop init, you see if autonomous is not null, so that means if it's still running, if the command is still running, cancel it. So that makes sure your autonomous stops when teleop stops, right? And so yeah, that's basically it. I know that was long. I, I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> but now we are going okay, any any questions? If not, I'm going to switch over to Trey. And Trey, you are going to be the host now, so you can present. And yes, and I'm going to stop presenting. And I'm going to mute myself. So yeah, Trey, take it away. Trey, you're muted if you're talking. See okay, so building and deploying code. So once you have the code written, you'll need to get it into the robot. And so what building and deploying the code is, is it, so you'll start from the source code. It'll then go into a compiler, which turns the source code into bit code. And then that bit code or byte code goes into the Java virtual machine, which then turns the bytecode into machine code. And that's just how Java does it since we're using Java and then the computer will know how to do it. And it's different for, the reason it uses this two-step process is because it's different for each, like different computers use it, use different source code or different bytecode. And so, it sends it to the compiler instead, so that way it has it constant for all things. So the way that we'll do it, it the, what it does is it converts the, yeah, this is just, it, the, it builds the code and then deploys it over Wi-Fi or cable, which could either be internet or U ethernet or usb we'll mostly be using um i think we use cable but it works either way you'll be doing for deploying the code it doesn't really matter but as long as you get it so oh i just like to say there um for the most part when you're doing it outside of like competition you're just gonna do it over like um like wi-fi you know like your radio but when you're at competition you have to configure your radio to the field and that's when you're going to be using your cable the most because it no longer works over wi-fi that's just why okay so here's an example of building and deploying the code so you're in the vs code You've got your code. Sorry. I don't know why, but my screen recorder didn't do this. 
basically you i there when i was circling my mouse it was just saying that i need you need to make sure you're connected to the robot i clicked on like the little wi-fi thing in the corner um yeah you just need to make sure you can um you're connected to the robot that's all that was yeah okay so make sure that you're connected to the robot's wi-fi you can that once you're then there you press Control shift p and you bring up this menu so as you can see it one of the options is deploy robot code and it has the shift plus F5. That's like a shortcut. I've tried to use it before and I'm not exactly sure how that works. I'm not sh like, I've tried it a few different ways and I haven't gotten it to work, but if you can find it out how to work, it'll be a easier way. So then yeah, you do the control shift P to pull this up. You then would deploy robot code. And then it starts to do it. You'll have to be connected to a Robo Rio, which is why it fails here. But it'll build and then deploy if you have it connected properly. So then testing the code with the driver stations, you'll have two things that are going to be used this there's this shuffleboard and this dashboard the um shuffleboard you can program to give these different all these different variables that will have values that you can use your code to show and then there's this down here you'll have to be connected to the once you have your code build it and deployed it'll then have those buttons down there that are currently blocked, the enable and disable, you will be allowed to disable it or enable it. And so over here is the, is like information about the, like the battery and all of this, but since nothing's connected, then they don't return anything right now. Those also show things. You can also change different, oh shoot. You can change the, like the team station, which is gonna be based on what position you are, like what team in the match, what it will do where you are so you can have it do different things in depending on that. And then those are the different uh, modes that you'll be in. You can either have it in a test mode or a practice mode, and then it'll be in, you can have it test the autonomous portion or the teleoperated period. And then you can also enable or disable it depending on if you've got it. And then you can go to a different the other tab and it's got information. Then there's the settings tab. You can change the team number, uh, the dashboard type, which we're using shuffleboard, which is why we have it set to shuffleboard, some data, some like practice timings. It says countdown, autonomous delay, teleoperated and end game. There's the different um, variables we have set and then here's a USB order. So this, you'll have different controllers. And like we were talking about before, there's the drive operator, the drive and the operator. And they'll each need to have a port and like an identity. So if you have something plugged into port one and port or port zero, then it needs to know what it is exactly and so you give you right there you tell it what it is and like it'll show you what's plugged in so that way and then you can tell it which so that way in the code you know which port to give the drive joy and the op joy or controller did it again okay
you can actually make that um, video like full screen if you like go in the corner. Yeah, okay. there. And then in this last bit, it's got more things that you can check. And that's that. And then, so version control is um basically there's this, we use GitHub, and it allows you to have control of the, like, you don't have to constantly be using VS code, you can save it on one computer using GitHub. So that way you can then use, you can get the code on a different computer. So there's some vocabulary that GitHub uses. There's repository, which is basically just the storage of your, it's like your, your code. And then a commit is the, um, particular save state of the repository you can have like so like if you have it as it's saved you can then change it and then commit it so that way it's now saved and then as that and then a branch is basically it's a separate it's a different one and if you want to edit it but you don't want to make it permanent change you create a branch so that way you can then have it separate and you don't necessarily mess up anything else you can push which will update the it'll be like push the code onto the github onto your vs code which is basically instead of just control c control v everything over you can push it onto the Is pull, which is basically the opposite of that, just doing it in reverse. And then clone is retrieving a local copy of a repository. It's like any other, like it's like copying it to make and like making one of your own, kind of like a branch, but of an entire, but like you can create a commit for yourself. And if like you find something on find someone else's, you can create a clone that you can edit yourself. Then a fork is duplicating a pre-existing repository to modify and compare against the original one. And then to merge would be to combine different changes from branches, commits, and forks into a single thing. To, and you would only want to do that if you make sure that nothing is going to be broken by that because then you'll lose stuff but once you have it you can then it'll be on a single thing and now uploading oh, code to I just like to clarify one thing so with the pushing and pull so how that works is your computer has a local repository so that's all on your computer and then there's something called a remote repository which is like github and so when you're pushing something, you're pushing the info from your local repository to the remote repository, and pulling is going from remote to local. I just want to clarify that. So then uploading code to GitHub, to do that, you would need to log into, you would log into GitHub and then make a new repository, or if you've already got one, you can use that. You would then copy the URL that GitHub gives you. It'll be like at the top. Then you would go into VS Code, add, and use the command add remote by doing the Control Shift P, and then type in, or not necessarily, don't, you don't have to type it, you just Control V it, paste it in, and then go to the, and you should have also given it a name, and you can go to the source code tab in VS Code, and commit the code, and then finally push the code to your GitHub repository. And then here's videos showing it. So 
here's GitHub, and it's a new. She's creating a new repository, giving it a name, which will be Workshop Two Example. And then you can give it a description if you want. That isn't necessary, and it's she creates a long one. And then you can make it public or private, and then you create it. And then once it's created, right up here, you can, it has the URL in which you need a copy. And then once you have it copied, you go into here, into VS Code, and then right here is where you would go to the the pay, the bit where you would need to commit it. Then you choose that, which was the repository. It then has this. You would then do the commit all, so that way it'll go on. And then you give it a name. It can be anything, but you want to have it a useful name. And then you can add remote and then put in the name, which was workshop to example, and then the URL, and then it pushes it all onto here. And since it says right here that there were zero changes, but that's because we didn't make any actual changes. This was just the example. And then it's right there. And then it loads and you got it. And then Here, we're back at GitHub. And then you can go to the workshop. You can then go to the source main, which is where we put our code. And, the, and then here's the different bits. And then you've got all the code here that you can then, it'll stay in GitHub, so that way you don't have to have it only on that computer. And then it'll do this, it's the same for every a file so that way it isn't stored just on your computer and you can use different computers to store to have the code and then you can create the branches from here it's only got one branch at the moment and that's that so now we're up for Questions. I'd also like to say something. Um, a lot of times a commit is referred to um, committing either to a local or to a remote repository. So in that process there, the first thing I did is I hit commit changes. So what that did is it committed it to the local repository. Then I added the remote repository, I paste in the URL, and then I said push to that local repository. So it took the local repository and pushed it up to the remote repository. Yeah, and then, yeah, does anybody have any questions about that? I know we went through everything kind of fast. It was kind of, a, it, this meeting was longer. We still have about like seven minutes left. Um, so yeah, just, oh, and also, we are going to, I'm going to be posting the, um, the post, um, the post survey. survey, post survey in the chat. I can speak. It is fine. <laughs> um, and please fill that out. Like it really helps us um, kind of like discern what we need to do. Um, yeah, I'm just going to get that a second, but yeah, I'm still taking any questions.
Here we go. I'm going to send it to people. Copy. Okay. So I am posting this in the, ch the chat now. And please fill this out. Like, it, it, it will take you, like, two minutes. There, it's, like, ten questions, all multiple choice. Well, there's one non-multiple choice, but it's, like, optional. So, like, <laughs> it, like, shouldn't take you long at all. And otherwise, if we don't have any questions, um, I, I guess I'd just like to thank all of you for coming. I hope this helped. Uh, I, I want to thank all of our presenters. Um, they did a great job. And so, yeah, I guess this concludes our automation workshop. I hope you guys learned something. Thank you. <laughs>